Okay, good morning. Um, I'm going to actually move this just a little bit and then we'll, we'll be able to. We put that there to hook the radio okay, controller. Okay, perfect. So uh, we, we were asked to come and, and give you a little bit of an idea of maybe, maybe just three of, of the committees that the faculty are kind of working on right now. And we want to say that, that we appreciate kind of the chance to do it. When we were talking um, together about how we might want to you know, contextualize this for you all, we thought since really kind of all the talk right now is about 21st century education, it's kind of funny that when you talk about 21st century education in schools, it's 12 years later and now we're finally talking about 21st century <laughs> education. So um, this is kind of, uh, in, in some ways, it's a bit of a metaphor for the way things kind of work in schools, which is to constantly be playing catch up with, with, the, rest, with the rest of the world. But, but we have kind of what we think is kind of a unique perspective on, on the question. And, and we wanted to talk about it in terms of three committees. So um, Adam will talk to you about his committee work, which is with the Character Ed um, Committee. Gulliver will talk about um, the, work, the work that the committee has been doing around diversity, access. And, and then I'll, I'll talk a bit about what the Innovation Committee is, has, has been talking about. We just kind of want to let you in on what our conversations look like. Um, and then what we thought we would do is we're going to move kind of quickly and we thought maybe what we could do is leave, if we have questions, we would really love to hear questions, but we'll kind of lump them together at the end so that, because we know that you have a lot more in your program that, that you want to get to as well. Um, so definitely thank you for letting us do this. I'm going to let Adam be uh, kind of up first here. Great. Welcome everyone. Um, so I'm working with the Character Education Committee this year um, and I wanted to give you a little rundown as to sort of what we're doing. Um, so, what, so Scott mentioned 21st century education. This is sort of the, you know, kitschy term of the day. And uh, absolutely at a place like this, one of, an, one of the enormous components, which I would hope would still be a part of this place in the 22nd century, is sort of character, right? I think that's has an enormous part of the reason you guys are sending your kids here, right? That you know that we're aware of that, that we care about that, that we're holding ourselves as a faculty, as a staff accountable. So let me let you know uh, what we, uh, what our goals are as a committee this year. So we wanted to do three big things. Number one, we wanted to define character for this place. Not in abstract terms, yes there might be some vague language from time to time, but getting very clear about what we want to try to impart to kids, inculcating kids, teach kids. Number two, what do the best practices from other school communities reveal? What are other schools doing? Right? And number three, uh, what is the most current scholarly research coming out of universities and ed schools and psychology programs reveal about uh, character education? So those are the goals. So let me let you know So how uh, Matthew Nelson and I have had to structure this experience this year uh, is we're, we're, we tried to just read things. So let me, let me let you know on three things that we've done. So we've read uh, David Brooks's The Limits of Empathy, Paul Tuff's The Character Test, and then uh, this last uh, piece down here, I've done for an integrity uh, exploration I'm doing um, for the school this year. So David Brooks, The Limits of Empathy. What, uh, you guys might have heard of David Brooks, this sort of the editorialist. Um, uh, his question was, does teaching empathy change moral behavior? And really, uh, what his essential thesis is, uh, is that it, uh, it's only a small component. That character is actually a lot more. That actually uh, just uh, being empathetic is not enough to change behavior in a meaningful way. If people are familiar with the, the famous psychology experience uh, experiment by Stanley Milgram, with the, the shock experiment right there, uh, you know, the people were very concerned about the people they were allegedly shocking, but it didn't, even hearing them scream didn't change them from not <laughs> continuing to shock them, right? So uh, what we took away from David Brooks's article is that we need to, that, that empathy is going to be a component, but we need more, okay? So that led us to Paul Telf's The Character Test. How does learning to deal with failure relate to one's success and happiness? What Tuff is trying to do is actually give us a pretty clear sense of what the specific components of character are. So um, I can give these to you at the end. I made 20 copies if you guys are interested in the character stuff. This is actually a report card that the KIPP schools, uh, the charter, the highly successful charter program, um, uh, hands out to all of their students, okay? And this lists components of character. Let me just read you the categories right here. Um, zest, grit, self-control, optimism, gratitude, social intelligence, curiosity. So we're not talking about AP Psychology, US History, and Biology here, right? We're talking about a very different skill set. One that we're all interested in, but we 
struggle to quantify. There's even some concern there, even with our own committee. Do parents want to hear this? Is it appropriate for us to judge other human beings on this level, right? So this is the conversation that we're trying to have, okay? Uh, the last little um, piece that I wanted to bring to your attention is actually by uh, an individual who runs the sort of honor program, integrity program down at uh, UC San Diego. And she wrote a, a book called Academic Integrity in the 21st Century. And what she's trying to do, I highlighted it over here, how can we ensure students are learning, as opposed to how can we stop kids from cheating? So typically the conversation around integrity, around honor, is how do teachers, how do administrators, how do we stop kids from cheating? What she wants to do is actually flip that on its head and say that actually you're trying to hike a mountain there that's too steep and you're, you're going to die on that mountain. Instead what we need to do is we need to flip it around and we need to say teachers, administrators, school communities need to focus the full front of their attention on how do we make sure that classrooms and curricula are ensuring that kids are learning and that's assessment, that's um, uh, you know, experiences you know, in and out of the classroom. Okay, so what we, um, a couple of things we wanted to, th this is the vision, okay? Uh, and there are three elements to the vision. Number one, uh, what we want to come out of this year with as a committee is to develop discrete curricular opportunities that expose, encourage, and inculcate character. Uh, all the kids at this school uh, go through the, uh, Mr. Nelson's morality and social justice class. Uh, all of them, senior project is now a graduation requirement where they're going to be needing to look at needs at areas of opportunity in a local community, a global community. And then of course the chapel services right there that kids are going through on a weekly basis, hearing from peers, hearing from teachers, hearing from outside speakers. Number two, develop discrete extracurricular opportunities. So the previous one being curricular, this being extracurricular opportunities that expose, encourage, and inculcate character. So this is retreats. This is the service hour requirement we have. Assembly speakers that come in and, and you know, uh, talk about health issues or whatnot. Um, and what I'm going to push for at the end of the year is actually adding uh, an honor council uh, to the mix where kids can sort of get a little experience actually sort of uh, having a little more of, a, of a, a direct stake in their community. And the third piece right here, develop character assessments that provide data around student growth and efficacy. Um, I don't know if this KIPP uh, character report card is exactly what we'll do, but I got to tell you, uh, zest, grit, self-control, optimism, gratitude, social intelligence, curiosity. I, I would hope, uh, I, I think as a community we do a really good job of this and I think we could do better if we got a little clearer about this and people were thinking about it in, in slightly more discrete terms. I think that would be welcomed by this community um, to uh, get feedback and, and see areas, what are, what are the growth edges of my students, what, what, what are they doing fantastically, right, those sorts of things. So those are, that's the character education community. Turn it over to Mitchell Vajay now on uh, diversity. All right, so our committee um, really wanted to, to look at diversity at the Priory, um, what it means. Um, if, for those of you who don't know, I work with the Access Program, um, worked with Bridge, which I know a lot of you have heard about for years, and also teach. Uh, but one thing as a community we wanted to do is come in and, and look at, first of all, why is diversity a part or should be a part of 21st century education? Um, so this is a quote by Dr. Juan Carlos Ruz, just talking about the process of education and globalization. And when we think about diversity, thinking about it globally. So not just some of the smaller aspects we've thought of, you know, we've thought about it sometimes in, in terms of multiculturalism, um, you know, religious diversity, but really looking at everything together at the globalized world and how things are all sort of coming together in various, um, in various arenas of the uh, 21st century. And so a couple of things here um, in a story as you look over um, those two points, and this was really highlighted to me when we were looking around and seeing, and I talked to uh, somebody who's an Apple recruiter who works to, to recruit um, a lot of, of people from around the United States to Apple for uh, computer engineering type projects. And one of the interesting things he told me was that as he's going out there and looking at universities and bringing in these um, computer science people, is he's finding that the, the, the students who are coming from 
believe it or not, the more the public, the, the bigger schools come into Apple and have sort of the background um, along with the core knowledge and have been around multicultural environments enough that they feel like they are, are um, performing at a level not just that shows that they can get the job done and have an end product, but really deal with the things that happen within the process. And so um, whether that's, you know, can totally be put on the aspect that, that, that this type of education, you know, whether it be compared to, say, some of the people that were coming out of Harvard or MIT, was it due to the fact that they were in situations where they were more able to be more cultural, culturally resilient and, and, and develop sort of a cultural competency, which is what we'll, what we'll talk about. So our goal of uh, creating lifelong learners is enhanced here at the Priory. And we wanted to look at next why it's important for the Priory itself. And so creating lifelong learners in an increasingly globalized world of opportunity, promoting diverse mindset and instilling cultural competency is a critical 21st century skill. So the word competency. Cultural competency. Um, in diversity, we were looking and researching and through going to some conferences, some of the definitions that are used out there today in education have to do with being culturally resilient. And so there are five key aspects, they say, that students develop um, to become culturally competent. And they are through these five aspects of cultural resiliency, critical analysis, Adaptability and agility, innovation and imagination, cross-cultural communication, and teamwork. And so what we find is a lot of students who are coming, say, to the Priory from diverse backgrounds exhibit a lot of these things in terms of cross-cultural communication. Communicating one way in their home environment and then coming to a different environment for the day for education and communicating in a completely different way. Um, critical analysis that their culture, that, that their ethnicity, their, the, the background, the socioeconomic areas they come from, there's always sort of a critical analysis piece to their everyday life that they take on, that they see, that they're able to think about. And these types of things, becoming culturally resilient, has never really been measured. There's never been assessments out there to really see how that works. How does a person become culturally resilient? and ultimately culturally competent. It's just sort of something through life experiences that you attain. Um, and it goes back to what the person from Apple was telling me about people who come in and really what he was kind of saying is we really see productivity from people who have cultural resiliency and ultimately become competent um, in, in their culture and with the cultures around them. And so these, these five things are, are great things that, that are part of a priory education um, as it is right now, but are good things to look at and see how can kids at priory continue to grow in these areas and what kinds of things can we do as a faculty, as a school, as a community to, to push these things so that kids do become more adaptable and have agility in situations and don't necessarily um, freak out because something doesn't go right or doesn't go their way, right? And so these are things that, that we realize are really part of a diverse education when we talk about diversity. So the path from exclusive club to an inclusive organization, you can see that a lot of schools um, have started sort of a status quo with the value, the dominance of one culture, style, or group. And through time, there's been a lot of change. And so the idea would be that when you attain a, a strong level of diversity in your school, a 21st century sort of culturally competent school that you have added the value added of diverse cultures, styles, groups, and clubs, and you become an inclusive organization, both on the local and global scale. And so you see that change. But of course, there's a, tr there's a transition, which takes a critical mass. There's tolerance of differences that kind of come along the path. So you finally end to that change, which is great, because it gives it sort of a visual of probably where a lot of schools were, and where a lot of schools, especially independent schools, are trying to, to push to get to in the 21st century. 
So the next step was, OK, we understand it. We need to know why diversity is important, not only in education, why it's important at the Priory. So what are some things we could actually tackle to begin to sort of fill in the gaps and continue to grow in a way that allows our students here at the Priory to become culturally confident, to have some of this resiliency, and to take that along with the knowledge and the great academics and the character education all together to become a, a, a great um, leader in their community and be able to, 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 to navigate the world around them as it becomes more global, as, as globalization continues to, to be a big part of everything we do. So we wanted to look at our program, Benchmarking Against Others. Um, we've added a diversity center. If you ever want to come up, faculty office building, there's a mural that the kids painted. Um, there's some couches. It, it's, it's open to all our students to come see uh, things that are going on at the school um, in terms of diversity. Um, we have a student-led group dedicated to diversity with lots of students from, from all different corners of, of Priory. Um, we have a diversity steering committee. They uh, wanted to highlight this youth summit. We just had four kids come back from a Latino conference that uh, they had brought a lot of great insight and they want to, uh, are very excited about. One kid got some, uh, some information that they want to use in their senior project. Um, some of the other kids are excited to come back and share some of the ideas from the faculty. Next year, we want to take a group to the People of Color Conference back in Houston. So some of the future goals, um, continuing to look at things like expand budget, um, enhance preparative students entering ninth grade from diverse backgrounds. This is always a key, making sure that, that, that kids coming in from different areas have sort of the same skills, um, have tools to navigate the Priory landscape, whether it be how to talk to teachers, um, what books you need, that there is summer reading, all these types of things. Um, and we've talked about maybe having some online components to that as well. What are the gaps that kids need to have in, in physics, for example, when they come in? Ninth grade here, they take physics. So what are, the, what are some of the math concepts that need to be uh, completely sort of dominated by the time that they come in so they don't have any issues with that. Um, teacher and staff training, exposure to diversity, bringing the world uh, to Priory and bring our students into the world. Um, transitioning some kids into the, into the middle school program from access, so having more of a presence uh, with our, our access students in the middle school. And continually uh, looking to, to actively recruit to, uh, to and evaluate uh, diverse students. And one thing that that also means, going back to the cultural resiliency and competency aspect, is when we look at kids that we want to have come here to the Priory, it's easy sometimes to get caught up in test scores and things like, and things like uh, grades and so forth. But sometimes it's important to measure and, and find ways to sort of assess the cultural resiliency that they bring and that that's a strength that they can, they can help teach uh, our community teachers and students alike. Okay. And, yeah, and then I'll move through this uh, fairly quickly. The Innovation Committee actually really just decided that what we wanted to do was not necessarily define innovation. It's almost impossible. Every time we go to any kind of conference and we find out what other schools are doing or what people's goals are, it's almost a panic sets in. Like we are never going to get in front of this thing. And we're not. And this has always kind of been something. When we realized, and this happened really, this started happening maybe about 10 years ago when, when we noticed that our kids are what they call digital natives. They don't, they don't understand the disconnect that we, that we see in, in the digital world, in online world, anything like that. They don't see it. So we're not going to get in front of them. They are smarter than we are, and we're not going to be able to help them in that way. So what we're needing to do is find some kind of posture here, some kind of attitude that's going to make it possible for us to continue teaching them as best we can, but also to get to the side and let them teach us along the way. And so I want to show you a couple things that we're learning about this. So the Innovation Committee really just decided that we wanted to do something that, that would um, support and also kind of uh, de continue to develop a culture of innovation. The interesting part about it is we're really proud of, of the attitudes around innovation here at the school. It, you, you might not find as many iPads in, in kids' hands 
as, as, as you might at another school. Some of that stuff might, might not be where our kids are, but there is a culture of innovation. There's a mindset of innovation, especially with our faculty right now, that, that it's hard to find in other places. And it's coming from real surprising places. And so a lot of that had to do with teachers being comfortable enough to make some mistakes and fail. And I, and we kind of, I want to kind of say that, that Brian has had a lot to do with kind of pushing us in this way to kind of make it, make it possible for people to take a risk in front of their classes and learn something new, which teachers, interestingly enough, it's hard to get us to kind of consider that. Um, we also decided last year that we don't want innovation that is everybody else's innovation. We want an innovation um, that, that tracks with our goals, with the things that we're already doing at the school, with the things that we're already proud of, the values that, that we hold, and, and the goals that we already have. So we said innovation has to somehow kind of match what our, ad, what our graduate outcomes already are. And those are, we want kids to communicate well. And, and that means across all, all platforms, that, that, that means not just in, in the way that, that they write, not just in the way that they talk, but in the way that maybe they communicate um, online, maybe, maybe the way that they, that they filter information, that they report back the things that they're learning. Critical thinking and problem solving. We actually found out from, from our alums when, when the board did an alum survey that, that we're, we're doing really well in, in this area. Students are graduating feeling like they, they've really had their critical thinking and problem solving skills sharpened um, here. And, and that's gratifying because we don't know necessarily why. <laughs> um, and and that, that we do have a third piece that actually does speak about. We have three goals, and, and one of them is that we want kids to, to appreciate interconnection. And I see that in the same, in the same you know, vein as, as a cultural competency, an awareness of, of the way things connect and don't connect and the way that things could be connected that, that might not be obvious yet. So this year, we decided what we did. Last year, we operated off of um, a survey that we did with kids, which we put a survey out to them asking, what would they like to see us innovate in? And they gave us these really interesting um, answers. We were expecting to hear a lot about iPads. We were expecting to hear a lot about products. What we heard from them is, we want you to find out ways to coordinate your work better so that we can be more efficient, so that we're not working at cross purposes all the time, so that um, our, our teachers are communicating from the same platform, uh, learning uh, from the same platform online. Are they get, is one teacher's class on Moodle, is another teacher's class, a handout is another teacher's class. And, and that's something that, that the teachers are interested in, but, but trying to get to that place is, takes, takes effort and takes work. And, and there's not a total buy-in on whether or not that's the right thing to do for kids, putting them all on the same platform because they're going to have to learn how to navigate different, different platforms all, all their lives. But it was something that they told us. So they were talking to us about workload, about the, the, the efficiency of their work, and also kind of about the, the, how meaningful their, their work was. Um, this is a faculty that actually really likes that idea, wants to look carefully at that. So this year we, we, we did, we kind of changed our work around stuff that Drew Ciancia is doing. And he did his summer work on student motivation and, and really wanting to take a look at what is it exactly that motivates kids? How do we get them to be um, motivated for, for their own learning and, and to want to do it on their own? And, and, it's, and it's led us to kind of take a look at innovation in terms of what do we do that, that kind of matches student motivation and then authentic assessments, assessments that can actually tell us what they understand. And, and not exactly what they can barf back to us after a week of, 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 of study in, in, in class. But what can they continually understand and also kind of rework for us? So there's, this is a really exciting opportunity, but we don't understand it yet. This, isn't, this, has, this thing has not been tested. There's a lot of talk about the flipped classroom. And if you're, if you're aware of what Khan Academy is and, and the idea that, that People are kind of changing things around from instead of kids coming to class and getting the lecture or the notes or something, they're doing that as homework and then they're coming to class to kind of workshop um, their, the, these skills. And, and it, it has a lot of potential, but, but it's still new. And, but the cool thing about it is we started hearing about flipped classrooms and then we went out and found out that our teachers are, are already trying these things. And some of our teachers have been trying it for quite, quite some time. Gabe Tang's been doing this for a while. Rick Reboff got into this really early. Yvonne Faisal's been doing this early. So Gully, Gully's been doing it using the smart board and kind of reporting back what, what they've done. So kids can reaccess what maybe has been done in the classroom or teach themselves for the first time. Um, 
a great thing was to find out that Nancy Newman, probably one of our most experienced teachers, has, has also found this. And she is just a fascinating person. She, she's been teaching forever. She's very, very, very traditional in many ways. But she's also completely on board to try this and see whether or not there's, there's value for her and for her classrooms. So I want to show you just real quick what, what it looks like for, for Nancy. Hopefully this will come up. Okay, hi. We are She's going to be so mad that we did this. Chapter 5, which is about exponential and logarithmic functions. The experiment is that we're going to lecture. You're going to watch the lectures at home as part of your homework. And then you're going to come to class, and you're going to do homework in class. When you're watching the lectures, we ask you to take notes. We ask you to think very thoughtfully about what we're doing. And we're so this is cool. You know, um, mostly not because we're convinced that we know exactly what we're, what we're doing, but it's cool because we have somebody, and we have, and we have more and more teachers who aren't comfortable with technology, willing, willing to give this thing a try. It's a lot more work for teachers. They, they, they have to put a lot more time into doing this ahead of time. But, but they're, they're really interested in, in seeing what this kind of means for kids. Um, and so that's, that's one thing that, that we've seen. I wanted to show you kind of another one. The, the idea of clickers. We could be doing this with cell phones, but we have, we have kind of reservations around kids having their cell phones out all the time. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> so, so the clicker idea really is that um, the science department bought, bought a set of, of clickers. It gives kids kind of real-time access to, and, and gives teachers real-time access to what kids are understanding. In the past, if I was up here lecturing and I, and I asked a question, one or two hands go up. Traditionally, it's hard and we want to keep moving, so we continue to call on those one or two people, or I cold call. Or I do something horrible and, and say, Courtney, well, what do you think? I know your hand wasn't up. And you, and you put a kid on the spot, and, and, and you don't necessarily know what they understand. This gives a teacher the ability to know exactly what their kids understand at any given moment. We could be working sometimes for an extra 45 minutes in a class and not even be fully aware that because of whatever social pressure, the kids aren't letting us know what they do and don't understand. And we could have lost and we could have been wasting 40, 45 minutes. With clickers, you can kind of get a sense of, I'll ask a question, I can kind of pull you, I can see what, what your understanding is. And, and the, the technology now lets us know exactly what questions kids are, are tripping up on. Could it be that I'm asking it the wrong way? Do I know that I need to loop back with a group of students? It gives us kind of a little bit better opportunity to differentiate instruction. And it's just one of the things, universities are using them because they have 500 people in the classroom. Um, we're, we're looking at using them and we're starting to use them just in terms of does this give us real authentic assessments about our kids understanding what, what it is that, that we're trying to do and are we moving too fast or could we speed it up um, from, from time to time. This other part I want to show you, this is actually kind of one of the cool things that, that actually we're learning about the, the process as well. It's not anymore about basically this, up, one person up in front of all of you talking at you and you passively taking it. We're finding that kids actually have a lot of agency in, in this too. That we're finding kind of this technology, but kids have been using it for quite a while. Um, Charlie Tidmarsh, is one of, he's, a, he's a sophomore student, he took it upon himself without even being asked to go and put his physics class that he had finished in a Khan Academy style platform for our students. So he went through and went through their book and put it, broke it down lesson by lesson for them. We didn't pay him a dime. We didn't ask him to do this. Um, but, but he did this on his own. The cool thing that we're finding out is actually kids want to and, and learn better from each other sometimes. And so when, when Bob Besson let them look at Charlie's videos versus Khan videos or any other things that they'd found online, they had a preference for, for Charlie's. And we don't know necessarily um, why that is, but kids said that they it resonated a little bit more for them. They found themselves using Charlie's videos more um, than, than, than Khan's. Oh, wait, we're still talking about Nancy. <laughs> so hold on. Let me see if I can. works exactly the same way. I know for a fact, too, that other schools are looking at Charlie Tidmarsh's as well. They can't have him. Sorry. Yeah. I know. It's... How are you going to evaluate? Are you going to talk? Yeah, we're going to... Well, 
we'll kind of give our best guess at that in a minute. Welcome to the first video on chapter 34, which is all about electric current and conceptual physics. And we're going to be first talking about section 34.2 in your textbook, which is... Okay. That's cool. And, and, and one of the things that, that, that is really neat about what, what this new kind of landscape is for kids and that they have so many products and so many tools and they're so nimble with it is, is that um, kids, there, there's a lot of learning to be done in putting expressive software out there for kids. And so for kids to be able to express what they understand and don't understand um, and then teach us and give us that, that kind of diagnostic is something that, that we haven't necessarily had before. Um, some things that we continue to work on. We, we did our first Fail Forward Friday last year, which was all about letting teachers make a mistake in front, of, in front of their kids and encouraging that, to try something that they normally wouldn't try because they really don't like flopping in front of their kids. It was really fun. It was really successful. And in some ways, we, we, we realized we can't be asking kids to take intellectual risks all the time if we're not going to kind of take some in front of them as well. And, and it was a popular idea. We're going to do that again. It'll probably be post-AP so that, because there, there are some teachers who want to maybe collaborate between classes on this. Senior project tends to be something that we learn a lot about. Um, we're, you know, we learn more and more from the idea of senior project um, every year. And we would love to find a way to start building that back into the curriculum so that they're not seeing some of these concepts um, as seniors, but that, that it, we're scaffolding it all the way up. Drew Ciancia is doing a lot of work in, in that direction. And then the library committee. A library is a great metaphor right now for, for schools as to like what our capacities are going to be for kids and, and what we want for them. I had this great conversation with Will Galway getting out of the car today. And he said, I spent you know, so much time this weekend driving around in, you know, from this library to this library to this library because they didn't have my book. And I thought, well, that, isn't that a perfect example of, of, in a lot of ways, what we're asking kids to do sometimes? We now have modern libraries are doing things very differently. And the, and the library as we know it is changing. And, and there's a lot of cool um, energy around this for us and what it might mean for us going forward, especially as we redesign the school and the campus, about what, what, what will the libraries look like? What, what are going to be the digital platforms that we need to use, the databases? Um, and, and how many books are being checked out? It's really a fun um, conversation in the moment. And then we thought, if you have a couple questions, we know that, that you have other, other things, but we're happy to, to, to take a couple questions for either diversity, character, or, or around innovation. Um, there's a question about toughening up kids a little bit in terms mm -hmm. of their character. And the reason is because I had a conversation with my elementary school librarians after the suicides in mm -hmm. Gun High School. The librarians in elementary school came together and decided that they actually want to expose the elementary school students to like, the Holocaust books that they usually keep away from the, mm -hmm. until they're older. So that the kids can kind of understand there's nastiness in life, there's kind of unfairness, there's a lot of more kind of unpleasantness of life, you know, kind of the spectrum rather than always be protected. So kind of in the middle school and high school, what are we doing to kind of toughen up our kids a little bit? You know, I don't know if that's the word for it. Yeah, I don't know if that's the word for it either. Um, that's, that's tough. Anytime that you kind of you put gun in the context and, and then we're talking about other things that, that, that kids might be experiencing in terms of, you know, r real, real, real depression problems or anything like that, it's hard for us to kind of to say that, 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 that we know exactly what we should be doing. I think we're toughening our kids up in a good way here. Um, I, I, I don't think the way that we toughen them up is by giving them more and more and more tough experiences, but, but that we some, somehow kind of like... And this is my opinion, that, that the point of a school like ours is to, to know them well enough that, that, they, can, that they can have some, some problems, they can have some mistakes, they can build some resiliency, but that we're next to them. Um, and it's not necessarily kind of what, you know, curricularly kind of are we exposing them to tough stuff. Our kids are, read some tough stuff, and, and they do do a lot of, of things that are really heavy. And I remember kind of hearing that criticism as a theology teacher that, you know, a kid would come in after a day we just finished the Holocaust, and now we just talked about Paul Pot, and now we're... I mean, it was heavy to kind of put that much on them, and that's not necessarily what we're looking to do for kids um, also. So I, I know that's kind of an incomplete answer, and I don't know if anybody else has. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think what Scott's saying there is, is... I think we're sort of philosophically opposed to just pushing kids in the deep end and hoping they sort of find their way back up to the surface. But it's <coughs> scaffolding... What? Fail forward Friday, right? We're modeling capacity to sort of flop and sort of pick yourself back up to that. 
right? And I think that's what we're trying to do. It's um, okay to fail, basically. Right, right, and 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 that and that perfect performance. I mean, not only is it an antiquated goal, it's just not real. It's not even realistic. I mean, it's a, it's a fake thing that you would say to try to, you know, fluff yourself up. When in reality, what we need to be teaching kids is is how to pick yourself up the mat rather than. Rather than. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, sorry. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I've tried to pick up your answer. <laughs> um, right, the, the, but the but the skill of being able to pick yourself off the mat is much more relevant than uh, um, uh, trying to uh, inculcate in a kid's mind that they're always going to be perfect. Right, and they've always they've always done well, so they're gonna go off to Stanford, and they're always gonna do well again. But instead, no, it's quite the opposite of that. Like, let's let's focus on scaffolding in a meaningful and safe way opportunities for kids to. Yeah, maybe you do in a scaffolded classroom. Look at the Holocaust or Pol Pot or whatever it is. And I want to say one other thing. One thing that's really kind of different about what we're trying to do with with the discussion, especially around kind of innovation and, and kids, is that there's so much out there. When you hear 21st century education, depending on who you're talking to, it can be presented in such a frightening way that it's, it's all about, you are about to enter the most cutthroat competitive world. Um, and and if, if, you, if, if you don't get these skills, you are behind, you're going to stay behind. It's, it's a real different vision than, than I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to keep kids hopeful you know, on, on top of everything, is, is that, you know, letting them know that, that there are 101 people in line for your job that you don't have yet, or doesn't exist yet, is a hard thing to kind of like, you know, express to kids in a way, and then still have them be um, open and, and, and excited about, you know, what, what, what their possibilities might be. So, so some of this is like, we don't want to beat kids down with, with something we don't know, which is the 21st century education is going to be cruel. You're most likely going to be a mid-level you know, manager for the rest of your life. And, um, unless you learn Mandarin, you know, do AB Calc, do all these other things. By this time, you are behind. And we've got to work on, on that as well. Because there might even be data that, that might suggest that. But we need to start talking to kids about, you don't need to put your foot down in the exact right place every single time and be sure that that is exactly where your foot has to come down. You need to be able to put your foot down and know that if, if, if there's a mistake, the next one can, can, be, can be a correction or it can be better. You can pivot on, on, on something like that. Um, I, I actually have a question for Delmer, but first of all, I want to make a comment that, you know, I think when a lot of uh, folks look at this school, um, and compare it to all the other schools that their kids can go to, public or private, is one of the things that we do so well here is character. Mm. And you know, we are creating leaders that will have character. So I really commend you for continuing this uh, with it. So I appreciate it. But this is a question for Galera. Um, I'm really trying to put my finger on what is diversity? What do you mean by that? Are we talking like international students from all over the world? Mm -hmm. Or are we talking income diversity? Help me out. Come over here, go. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we're talking about all those things, right? I think when we talk about diversity, we have to incorporate all of that and more things like religious diversity, like um, you know, physical disabilities, like um, sexual orientation, right? As an as a entire concept, when we talk about diversity, we have to hit all those pitches. Um, so, but when we specifically talk about, like today, talking about cultural resiliency, competency, and so forth, it's really looking at, um, say, a group the, the group of people, so socioeconomic students of color who may come to the Priory, be part of the access program and need to negotiate a different type of um, <coughs> set of standards culturally who bring something different to the table than, say, uh, a majority of, of the population that might have been raised in different circumstances are more connected with the culture where maybe the school is located. So I think when we're talking about it in that context, it's, it's talking about the, the the groups of people who are going to come to our school and encounter some of these, what we might not see as barriers because they're, they're, they're not barriers for, the, for, for, for people who have been raised or in this environment always. So do we it's find having... That, sir, as a follow-on, do we find that as yeah. well with the, some of our international students that they face those same challenges or not? Different challenges. Okay. Yeah, but um, some, some of them may be similar. 
and some of them may be, some of the, what they experience may be very similar to, to the larger population here at the Priory. But so yeah, I think diversity, you'll see, the, you'll see groups that are always going to, going to have their, their, their sort of differences. And so we have to be careful when we talk about diversity, we want to incorporate um, all aspects. Um, but talking about like some of the things today, cultural resiliency and, and competency in terms of different uh, uh, cultures that are what they're and, and what they're going to bring to the priory, they're coming sort of from different different uh, you know socioeconomic backgrounds for the most part, or different cultural ethnic experiences okay. from their backgrounds. So so some of that is seen with the international community in terms of. The Right. 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 So, so how, that's how, the. How, how, do, how does that? How do the students really, really, truly take advantage or appreciate that diversity that we have here? That some of the schools might have right. not quite as much of that. Right. And I think it's by I think it's by doing a lot of things we've talked about and like what Scott's mentioned, is is bringing those experiences into the classroom, bringing them into student activities, um, celebrating everybody. Who, who is a part of the Priory community, and at the same time, educating what that means, not only in terms of curriculum, but also um, just, just in terms of, like, you know, what, what does it mean to be Hindu, you know, and what are some of the practices within Hinduism, you know, so not only just talking about it curricularly, but, but you know, maybe there's celebrations that we see that we bring to campus, you know, for, for an assembly one day, um, you know, somebody realizes we had a, a Heritage Day like a month ago where a lot of students were talking about hearing some students, uh, you know, speak in languages they didn't know they spoke and talk about uh, creation myth stories from their culture. And you hear kids saying, wow, I didn't realize that, you know, so-and-so spoke French or, you know, had that sort of cultural experience when, or, or when, when they were younger. And so there was just sort of some of that talk. Some of it is just being around and, and being able to talk about it and feeling safe to talk about it and feeling like you're in a place where people are listening and appreciating and seeing that you are culturally relevant and that you have these skills and recognizing them as skills that, that, everybody, um, that everybody shares. Well, the cafeteria, I didn't know that, but the, yeah. the meals, I mean, we talked how many high school <laughs> how many high school kids know what non is yeah <laughs> want to do one more question or I just had two, two comments one was um, oh. about diversity and I, I've noticed in the boys um, one of the things that's made uh, an impression was when they um, have teachers and faculty that are able to share their personal experiences um, in, a, in a way that they presume are safe. Really, someone that you're connecting to and you look up to and you, and you respect and you, you know, because they're an adult, you think they're perfect right. and have an easy time of it. Right. Um, yeah. That has, ha I've come home and heard stories and I can just see the, you know, the look in the eye that, wow, you know, this has made a difference for me. Right. Um, and the other right. thing was about resiliency. And I, wish that I, this is my biggest challenge, because I'll talk to my son about it, and I'll t talk to him about resiliency and how important it is, um, and I can tell he looks at me like, okay, this is what you say to a kid who's failing. This is what you say to make him feel better. Um, he doesn't believe it. So I need something, you know, tangible. <laughs> and I don't know what that is. I don't know if anybody does, but that's my biggest struggle. Okay, well, I want to thank you three for presenting the <laughs> It's really interesting as parents to know what's going on every day with our students and as another conversation point at nighttime when they just look at us and blank stairs. <laughs>